Hi, this is your host Sapnil Bhartia and welcome to another episode of TFR Let's Talk and today we have with us Matt Ellis, board member of Finout.io. Matt, it's great to have you on the show. It's great to be here. Uh, talk, talk a bit about your own background, your own history and you know the whole FinOps, FinOut movement if you can call that. Yeah, um, I worked for some large firms in the 90s doing global infrastructure, people like Goldman Sachs and PepsiCo um, and got pretty close to the supply chain um, world. We were big on supply chains at Pepsi. I went through a couple of transitions at large scale and um, and then I, uh, I always liked startups. I'd run a computer games company as a teenager and so when the dot-com bubble came I I, I began to fix dot coms and spent 10 years in ad tech with the big data. And in ad tech, we uh, had to use the cloud at one point, long story, but we didn't have capacity in our data center. We were forced to use the cloud. We were not cool kids who used it before it was known. And um, and people were having trouble staying on top of the bill. In fact, you know, one colleague, um, he had a $100,000 overspend one month. Uh, they hit a, a warning saying too many instances. So he, he, um, uh, got rounded by opening new accounts and thought that he just started too many, but they weren't turning off the old ones. And so I'd had some experience of it. Um, uh, you know, I live in Oregon now. When I came to Oregon, I, I had to, there was no startup scene here. I had to come up with a new idea. And I was helping people move on to the cloud, and they also had spending issues. So I wrote a little tool that sent people a daily email. And um, I went off on holiday, and I came back after a week, and my voicemail was full of angry people who hadn't got their email. And they were really mad. And, you know, it's a good sign for a startup when people care when they don't get it. Conversations with these um, users who are all finance or business, they reminded me of my time in the 90s with the big supply chain users. And then it occurred to me that all that had happened with cloud, the simplest thing, is the technology had begun to mature. So now you could buy it as a service instead of having to install it. We both remember the days when you installed a Linux server in 2000 and 10 minutes later, it's not working. You had to have skill to keep it going. And so again and again in, in, in technical industries, that it starts with the hard bit is how to make it work. But once that becomes routine, now how much of it goes into your product? And you know, it's happened in the car industry, they used to grow rubber. When rubber was unlimited, they now had to say how much rubber goes into a car and what's the pros and cons of more or less rubber. And that was the inception for cloudability. And you know, still people didn't really get the message of these obscure, obscure economic um, theories and history of the supply chain. And, and so we had to create a simple way to understand it. And that's where FinOps came from. Um, uh, the term we coined at Cloudability to describe the um, working between groups of people using common language and common tools so that we could line up expense with income, the ROI, and, and really take some inspiration from supply chain, um, uh, supply chain technology in other areas. And the result worked out great for us. And today, you know, Cloudability is now part of Aptio. Um, they're great at bringing it into the bigger companies. And it feels like we built like the SAP or the Oracle Financials. Now it's time to build the NetSuite, which is a nimbler tool for mid-sized companies who can't afford millions of dollars a year and a 100-person implementation team, and yet still know that if they don't get hold of how to do more technology faster, cheaper, then they're going to fall behind their competitors. And the, the chaps that fin out the team, very exciting, very uh, dynamic team who really get the core of FinOps. Um, they call the company FinOut. And um, are really trying to solve these problems of getting the total bill across the whole company, of all, the whole technology bill of all the things, not just your EC2. Um, we're going to see more and more of the um, holy form services. Things like, why are you bothering to print, build an invoice module? Just send it to this company and they'll print it out for you. They'll mail it, they'll chase it, they'll do sales tax, they'll do multilingual. And so it was a, I was delighted to be asked to get to help and we started chatting and it ended up that you know we can get more involved. So I'm back in the seat, this time as a board member at FinOut and really excited about the whole future here for this space. Now, uh, if you look at, of course, Cloudability, it was kind of 2011 or something like that, if I'm not mm -hmm. wrong. It kind mm -hmm. of predates even Kubernetes uh, in, oh, yeah. in, 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 in that way, which also means that the world that you saw back then is totally different than the world we live in today. Cloud cost is becoming a, a very serious topic because of, of course, 
complexity that comes with Kubernetes and that's none of Kubernetes fault. Just like Linux kernel is complicated, you know, it's not, it can run, it runs on a toaster also, but you know, it's not meant for you to just open it up and uh, work on the LAMP stack there. So talk a bit about how you have seen the landscape change because also the users of cloud, you know, it's all, all the way from big organizations who are tech bohemoths yeah. to even uh, mom and pop shops. So first of all, would love to remind you that our first public appearance was at the Structure Show in July of 2011. And we were on stage with a little company that went on to be called Docker. So <laughs> we were all startups back then. It's a small world. So um, yeah, I, I mean, how the landscape's changed. So um, there's the classic adoption curve. So when we started Cloudability, um, you know, the smartest, coolest kids were in the room. And these people got cloud. Um, they loved cloud. They, they, when we talked to them, we were all geeking out about the same things. And our early customers were people we helped Adobe and Intuit move on to the cloud from selling a CD to selling a subscription. Um, we helped the Obama campaign, um, you know, win the 2020, 2012 election. Um, you know, we worked with all of the cool kids. But, you know, to run a big company, you can't just work with the, the smallest sector. And as you got into the middle of the market, the middle of the adoption curve, um, uh, previously until now, the only people who really took this seriously were on small margins. We're talking about airlines, supermarkets, private equity run software companies, or companies that were running low on money and needed to economize or had some kind of cost problem. And it wasn't considered that every company had a cost opportunity. And so it was very much like the first people who bought supply chain software you know, people like the car industry had to buy components from overseas or they went bust. They needed software to keep track of it. But like you didn't use supply chain software if you were selling potato chips. It wasn't necessary. But the thing that supply chain gives you is real super agility. Um, it lets you take advantage of suppliers who are specializing. So your unit cost goes down, your quality capability goes up. That's called comparative advantage. And if you think about a car in the United States, a car, family car like a Camry, it stayed the same price for the last 25 years, adjusting for inflation. But oh my, isn't it so much better, all right? Now in this particular case of a car, it could have gotten cheaper for the same car. And you see cheap cars turning up all the time at the six, seven, eight, nine thousand dollars $9,000. But people don't want a cheaper car, they want to spend as much as they can. So you get more features for the same price. You compare the Camry of 1993 with the Camry of today, I mean, it's just a different car, right? And crucially, any car company that didn't do this fell behind, went out of business, right? So some car companies like Saab, they just, they couldn't take advantage of the supply chain in the same way that Ford did. And they lost out. It's that simple. Toyota doesn't make wheels anymore. They buy them from people who are spending a billion dollars on people who are making the metal 1% stronger. And we're just at the beginning of that still with cloud. So a good recession always helps. Those of us who are veterans of the industry remember trying to make people use virtualization and then the 2000 recession came and suddenly there's no more money for co servers so you have to share and so you know a downturn like the one that we're facing uh, i think will widen the appeal of doing this extra work and have people really truly understand that instead of writing the invoice module buying it from a specialist is always going to let you be more nimble move faster uh, we're nowhere near where i've said we will end up at some point which is software companies write software and, and the rest of the world buys software. So you end up joining a whole bunch of large components together. Toyota doesn't make gearboxes anymore. They buy them from a gearbox manufacturer. And if you said in a, in a ballroom 30 years ago, that's where we should head, people would think you're crazy. So we've still got a lot of work to do to help the industry move to a place where you only write the software that's specific, unique, and advantageous to a business, and you buy and join together the rest. But it will come, and step by step. First of all, thanks for you know sharing that. And also I like the, the comparison analogy with the automotive industry because that's the closest we can come when we talk about supply chains, you know, and especially in complex the ones. Yeah, software right. supply chain, uh, because components are coming. And when you talk about open source and all those things, that's what is happening, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Companies, they are pulling Docker images or you know libraries and frameworks from different places. They don't have any idea where it's coming from. It's not right. just security issue. It could also be licensing issues. You may pull a wrong license, which is not compatible, and you can get into trouble. Uh, talk a bit about how much awareness that you see that is there when it comes to 
software supply chain understanding and then we'll we'll also talk a bit about you know finoffs a bit but let's since you brought up the point of cards let's talk about the software supply chain understanding in the market awareness again there's always a few trendsetters who talk about this stuff first and um Remember um, Salesforce talking about software just eating the world, and and now you have people like Twilio buying up companies and offering a bigger, bigger lump. Um, I still think there's a um, a tendency to not invent it here. There's still like uh, we can write this ourselves. You, you, you hear much more people saying, "Why am I paying money every day for this when I could just write it once?" Which totally ignores um, opportunity costs to write something else. Um, the, the need to kind of be uh, on on hand to make it better or uh, respond to regulatory and let security changes. But in particular, once you've made that investment, you're stuck with it. So if you go back to the car analogy, um, you know, I was working with a company in the early 90s that um, couldn't make double-sided multi-layer uh, PCBs. And we were talking about buying the equipment to do this, but we were it was, an, it was a borderline discussion. We ended up buying the boards from Taiwan. And we started beating our competitor. When we started this relationship with the company in Taiwan, um, they said, well, why are you doing this old technology? We've got an even better technology over here. And so we would have bought into what we thought was the best thing. The specialists were buying into the next best thing. And so by buying the boards, we weren't stuck with one type of design, one type of output. We could keep up with the technology. Now, cloudability, when I, um, it was nearly four years since I left, um, we were processing 100 petabytes a month of data accountability. That's with a P, right? And when people ask me in the diligence of the sale of the company, which database to use, I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> we use so many different types. And we would have a new customer come on board or a new feature, and we would evaluate new technology. And we were very promiscuous with our technology because we followed what was the best thing for the thing at the time. If we bought a giant database server, we would have been stuck on Oracle or whatever it was that we were we were in on, right? And these mindsets of agility and opportunity cost haven't gone very far in the mainstream. People talk about it, but they tend to still be doing things like they have been for the last 10 years. I'm on one thing at Amazon, I'm on one thing at Google, and I stick with it. It's, that's the feeling I get. I'm, I'm hoping it changes. Oh, once again, thanks for explaining that. Uh, now I want to talk a bit about FinOps as well. Uh, why companies should care about in today's world? We do talk about a lot of movements going on within the, you can see, it doesn't, I really don't know what is the right term to be used, you know, platform engineers, developers, DevOps, DevSecOps. So, so talk a bit about, you know, folks who are creating software and then responsible for maintaining it, operating it, securing it. Uh, where does FinOps fit there? Well, for the practitioner, for the people in the trenches who are firing on resources and turning them off, um, FinOps gets the business and the finance people off your back. It's that simple. So by linking your cost to your uh, revenue, your profit, people stop asking, why are you doing this? Why not that, right? Um, what a finance person does when they don't understand something is ask for more data. They ask more questions for more reports. So if you don't answer the question quickly, easily, in a language you understand, you're just creating more work for yourself. Now, what you can do is you can use your big brain to do the thing you've been doing for the last 10, 20, 30 years and, and talk technical so that they don't understand what you're saying and they try and leave you alone. But this isn't technical, this is cash, money. And they get a reminder every month of how much you're spending. And if you wanna see how engineers have a tendency to overspend, just look at any big engineering project, look at any bridge, any building, any train, new train or anything. It's just, it's always overspent and late because the engineers can't help making it better. So engineers need some financial discipline just to get it done. There's a there's an art to business, which is not investing too much, but not investing too little. And so, you know, you end up with a fairly adversarial uh, ongoing argument between the business, the finance group and the engineering, unless you can turn this into a, a cooperation. Now, if the business at a strategic level understands that using cloud is a strategic advantage, that it gives agility, it gives uh, opportunities, it allows you to deploy the latest technology, it doesn't give you a sunk commitment, uh, then they understand that the cost there's a cost to that. And if you don't do this efficiently, then you're going to make it more expensive or you're going to have to cut things, turn things off when you don't want to. And so, you know, en getting an engineer to be aware of this, engineers try not to write crappy code. There's a great 
YouTube video I was watching the other day, this guy wrote a program quickly and it took a month to run. And so his audience started trying to make it run quicker. And they got it down to under five milliseconds. Now, A, that shows you that we care about efficiency. And now with cloud, it's just another measure of efficiency. You can make it run in five milliseconds, but it costs a million dollars. We're not going to do that. All right. So it's common sense to be on balance, but also five milliseconds. What's wrong with five seconds? There's a thing where we can go a bit too far. All right. How much time did it take you to make it go from five seconds to five milliseconds? Are we going to get a return on that time? You know, and I think that what we see is in companies where engineers are properly valued, that they're really hard to find, that they don't grow on trees. Then we make the engineers only do the most important, most valuable things, and we outsource everything else we can. But in companies where engineers are overworked, and, you know, that extra overtime or that one extra feature isn't really valued, then this conversation can be harder. And what FinOps does, it normalizes the conversation. You can say other companies are doing this. You can say this is normal now. When FinOps Foundation became part of the Linux Foundation, that was genius. You're saying don't operate Linux without FinOps. If you're doing Linux on the cloud, you've got to master this too. So I think the idea that I think 60% of the Fortune 100 companies practice FinOps in some way or form right now, that the FinOps Foundation was telling me the other day, um, that should be 100%. It should be everyone who's using computers should be thinking about this in this kind of multidisciplinary way. The business and finance understand that when the, it's like a Toyota, imagine the financial controller coming to you saying, why did our wheel build double last month? Well, you know, we sold double the cars. That level of competency of an un, of interaction between the three groups should be native. Now you can start saying, well, what can we do? Now we understand what we can do. So, and so far it's been very well received. FinOps is, as a public concept is less than four years old and there's nearly 100,000 professionals claiming it as a job title. So it's really taken some hold in the industry. Very, very grateful for the support of all the different groups that have taken up, the big consultancy companies, the big tech companies. Everyone realizes we needed a language to talk to each other, and FinOps seems to be it. Excellent, excellent. Once again, thank you. Now, I also want to talk a bit about uh, you joined FinOps board. You touched upon that initially, but talk a bit about why you picked them. And of course, you know, capacity as a board member, how are you helping the ecosystem and community also? Well, uh, yeah. So, um, you know, when you sell a company, you have a non-compete, so you can't go work for anything remotely competitive for a while, right? Um, and my, um, I agreed to a three-year period, which seemed to be a reasonable amount of time. And um, I didn't want to go and build another cloud ability like this. I felt that there are people in the market who are already doing great work, so it's better to join them than trying to beat them. Um, and um, when my non-compete ran out, a lot of industry, folk, we had a very, the, the cloud business is very um, collaborative. That lots of people want to help, want to talk. So a lot of people showed me what they were doing. Um, there's a lot of super interesting things out there, and FinOps not going to be the only successful company. A lot of different takes, a lot of different places. This is what happens when the industry matures. You get specialization, where you get a very valuable thing that's not such a big thing, but it really is special in that corner. Um, but the FinOps people, they understood FinOps. I mean, they got the fundamentals. You know, they understood the supply chain. They and they wanted to take the tool into a very agile space where you or I would would use it if we're running a, a significant size company. You know, from startup through to a thousand employees, ten thousand employees. This would be your eye on our unit cost. Uh, we talked a lot about unit cost, accountability. We knew how much each customer cost, not on average, but on actual on the amount of data they processed, the amount of cycles they went through. And um, um, being that's going to make that normal, I think will be a real huge help to the cloud industry as a whole. As a board member, um, the number one thing I can help is to help them avoid the mistakes that we made. It's too late for us, but you can still save yourself. So um, it's interesting when you get really into a thing, a technical, there's some things that look obvious, but they're not that way. You think they're like this, but they're like that. And uh, Mark Twain said, it's not the stuff you don't know that gets you. It's the stuff you think you know that just ain't so. So the number one thing, a technical, the different types of board directors, some are financial, some are business. The number one thing a, 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 a former CEO can do is to be candid and honest about the mistakes that we make, the errors that we make, so that they don't, they're not repeated. And, and so that's the best thing I can do is share with the team. I also like to ideate with them um, and talk about my own ideas. But that's second place to just 
helping them to grow a business and, and serve the customer and build a really valuable company. Matt, thank you so much for taking time out today. And of course, you know, share your beautiful journey and also, of course, your role in the FinOps and the FinOps, you know, whole ecosystem. And thanks for sharing those insights. And uh, I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you.